Yep, this is Mr. Hefner. And uh, today we are going to take a look at a rather long short story. And this is by Sarah Orne Jewett. She is a regionalist writer, and again, a writer who includes some tones of, of feminism. After all, she is a woman making it in what was back then, uh, a man's field in, in writing fiction. And uh, she's a regionalist writer who focuses her stories in her home area of Maine. So I'm coming to you here from the rocky coast in Maine today. And um, I don't have anything else to say, so let's just get started. So today we're gonna to take a look at the short story titled A White Heron by Sarah Orne Jewett. I don't know why I have a blue heron. I don't even know if there is such a thing as a, a blue heron, but uh, I have a heron here. It's, a, it's, it's a, uh, a, a marsh type bird, long beak, very long legs, huge wingspan. Uh, it's gonna play into this story. If you've ever been to Maine, Maine uh, is the state in the United States to this day that still has the greatest percentage of its land covered with forest. And so forest is going to be uh, a big part of this, nature and forest and things. Um, our essential question for this today is gonna to be how does this regionalist piece uh, reflect attitudes towards industrialism? And so we've got two ideas in here. The first is going to be regionalism. Sarah Orne Jewett grew up uh, in Maine. Her father was a country doctor. She traveled around with him from small town to small town. Uh, and she had an appreciation for this wilderness kind of setting uh, in the Northeastern United States. At the same time, we're in a period of time in the late 1800s where factories are growing larger and larger. People are living in cities. Uh, it's an industrial economy. These factories are belching out black smoke, which just kind of rains down particulate matter over everything. Uh, we've got more people in smaller areas. So you have pollution, you have people getting sick from bad water. And here she is in the beautiful state of Maine and a little bit afraid perhaps that that industrialism could encroach on that at some point. So in today's story, uh, we have a, a main character who is really dealing with some internal conflict, struggling between the idea of wanting uh, to be social and have other people around and yet enjoying the idea of being alone with nature and preserving uh, you know, that natural kind of environment. The reader's journal, the think about question, whatever you wanna call it here is, what secret have you kept and why did you keep it? <laughs> that sounds like a very prying question to me. And that's not ever one, that's not one that I would ever ask you to write in class and talk about. But it leads us to the idea that in this story, our protagonist has a secret. And there are certain benefits in sharing that secret with another character in the story, but she's torn. Because when you share a secret, there's always a risk that's involved as well. You know, there's a, the old idea that, uh, I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said, two can keep a secret if one of them is dead. Uh, it's very hard for people to keep other people's secrets. And so our main character is going to be torn with the idea of, do I tell what I know or do I just keep it for myself and let it go like that? There's a picture of Sarah Orne Jewett. Uh, she, again, like everybody we've had lately, she's born before the American Civil War. Uh, she lives well into the, uh, the 20th century, living till 1909. Uh, over on the right of the slide, I put a pine cone and tassel just because, believe it or not, that is the state flower of Maine. The state flower of Maine is the pine cone and tassel. I didn't even know pine cones were flowers. Sarah Orne Jewett is born in South Berwick, Maine. Berwick is a little bit north of Portland, Maine. It, it, at, even at the time, it was a part of Maine that had probably more people living there than other areas of Maine. Uh, what, but at the same time, compared to something like Massachusetts and the Boston area, uh, it was still fairly remote. Uh, I think I already said at the beginning, her father was a country doctor and doctors in those days traveled around and made house calls, went from town to town to visit people. And when she was a little girl, she often traveled with her doctor uh, with her doctor, it was her doctor, but she often traveled with her father uh, and she learned a lot about medicine just by being with him. In fact, she's going to write about uh, a country doctor later on in her life. When she was young, she was inspired by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Now you might remember from our Civil War unit, we mentioned Harriet Beecher Stowe as the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, the story which showed people in the North about the horrors of slavery. 
And that was Harriet Beecher Stowe, as, as a woman, uh, published Uncle Tom's Cabin, which became the best-selling work of fiction in American history up to that point. So that was quite an accomplishment. Sarah Orne Jewett, when she was young, uh, was inspired by this. She wrote a short story, and it was published in The Atlantic Monthly, which is still published today just simply as The Atlantic, uh, but it was probably America's number one most respected literary magazine at the time. And uh, she was only a teenager when she got published in there. That makes it even crazier. Uh, her stories celebrate rural Maine. Not this, first of all, Maine doesn't have any really big cities even today. Uh, the city of Portland is probably their biggest city and it's quite a bit smaller than the city of Reading in Pennsylvania. She wrote a lot of short stories and uh, these are her collections of short stories. I've never read an entire collection. I'm just familiar with some, uh, some odds and ends by her. Um, and she is a regionalist writer. So in the cities, if you live in Philadelphia or you live in New York City, you might be interested in what is life really like in, in rural Maine. And so that's what she celebrated as uh, she told her stories. Now, this particular story, as I said, is regional literature. So you have that right up there. And uh, we've got what's, I don't wanna give too much away about this story, but what we've got going on in this story is you have a young girl who's our protagonist. She has been sent to live in rural Maine with her, her grandmother because her grandmother's getting older and is having trouble taking care of the farm, and she's a helper. And it turns out she loves this rural setting, the girl, not the grandmother, loves this rural setting so much more than the area with people. She's not a people person. She, she likes spending time with herself and her thoughts in this natural setting. And then she encounters a young man and she's a young girl, but she's still sort of drawn, you know, has sort of a crush on this young man, wants to make him happy. It turns out that this young man uh, collects wild birds. He thinks they're beautiful. He's studying their, their plumage, what, you know, what their habits are. However, he takes one of every one that he's interested in to mount, which means he shoots them and he mounts them uh, to put them in, her collect in his collection. And she's torn between the idea of she really likes this young man, but at the same time, she can't understand why he kills the things that he finds so beautiful in order to build his collection. He's interested in a particular white heron that he's seen, and he's hoping she can lead him to its nest. And so the story is going to deal with a lot of internal conflict of she wants to please the young man. She wants to please her grandmother because this young man's going to offer money if she can lead him to this heron. And yet at the same time, she's, she feels an obligation to nature and to the heron itself. And she's going to deal with, a, uh, deal with a struggle internally of, do I tell him the secret and, and lead him to the heron? Or do I keep it a secret, lose the money, perhaps lose his admiration and protect the heron at the same time. So again, this, this has overtones of industrialism encroaching on this natural world. Uh, there's a white heron for you, not a blue one like I had in the cartoon figure at the beginning. Here are our literary terms for this particular unit, conflict, which you know. There are different types of conflict. A conflict is, is any time you have two opposing forces in a work of literature. Two main types are external, and then there's internal. Within the external type, you might have a person against another person. You might have a person against nature, such as uh, somebody trying to stay alive in a bad storm or something like that. This story is going to focus uh, almost completely with internal conflict. What is going on in Sylvia? She's the young girl. What is going on uh, in the young girl's mind as the story goes along? And then motif. And motif is something you might recognize from other years, but anytime you have a repeated element, in this case, it's going to be, one of them is going to be the birds. Every time, you know, mention of birds comes up, that is going to be a motif. It's going to set a feeling uh, for this story. So a motif is a repeated element or a pattern or a, a, a phrase, maybe just a word that comes up again and again. And the author puts it in there for an artistic purpose. It's not just accidental. As you read this selection, what you should look for is look for that internal conflict. It's not going to be too hard to find because that's the focus of the story. Look for examples of American regionalism. Why would someone in a big city on the East Coast 
be interested in reading this story about rural Maine. Look for the conflict, uh, look for the motif of birds, which comes up again and again, and look for another example of reversal. We've talked about reversal before, and when we get into uh, the 20th century, it's gonna be a, a very common element of stories. Look for where in the story, uh, every, the, the, the actions in the story seem to be heading in a certain direction, and then something is going to happen that changes that uh, direction of, of those things. All right, now this is the point that you should stop watching the video. You can pause it, go read the story. It's pretty long. It's probably gonna take you about 20 to 30 minutes to read this story. I've also provided you with an audio version. So if you wanna listen as you read along, you can go ahead and do that. Personally, I don't like the narrator of that audio version. So I would just rather read it on my own. Plus, if you're a good reader, you can read a story silently in much less time than it takes to read one out loud. All right, so go check the story, and when you're finished, come on back here, click play, and we'll go on with the uh, check for understanding questions. All right, so let's go on with these check for understanding questions. First, we have some true and falses. First one, Sylvia was extremely familiar with the woods, woods around the house, and that's absolutely true. She's always exploring. She's always out with the cow. Um, chasing that cow down to bring it back in when it runs off. She loves being alone and she loves being out in nature. Number two, Sylvia wished to return to her family in the city. No, you might think that a young girl away from her family would just wanna go home, but she feels like she didn't even live until she came here to the farm in rural Maine. Number three, Sylvia was happy to encounter the man on her way home. She was quite uneasy about this. And so I, I would say that false would be the best. Again, this is one of those questions where true and false, it's either yes or no, right or wrong, true or false. There is no middle ground. And I find that literature does not lend itself very well to true and false questions. Number four, Sylvia could not understand why that man that loved birds killed them. And that's absolutely true. You know, why couldn't he be a photographer? You know, instead he had to mount them. He had to literally stuff their dead carcasses to be able to put them on display. And number five, Sylvia had more loyalty to nature than to people. And that's absolutely true. And I hope you've read the story before you go and look at these uh, answers because there are definitely spoilers in here. Uh, at the end of the story, she makes that decision to do without the money, to disappoint the young man, and instead to protect the heron and not reveal its nest the location of its nest. Uh, number one here, we'll forget about the number, but uh, we have some multiple choice. Sylvia is living with her grandmother because her mother was unable to care for her. Her grandmother was lonely and wanted Sylvia to come for summer. C, her grandmother needed help on the farm. Or D, she was afraid of people. Yeah, it's C, her grandmother needed help on the farm. Uh, I'm not sure that Sylvia was afraid of people. That was the thing her grandmother said, you know, when she took her in, made it work out even better. Uh, she wasn't a people person, uh, but the grandmother needed help on the farm is why she was there. Number two, uh, the guest was in the woods for what purpose? To enjoy nature, camping adventure, because he lost his way home or to collect the birds. And he is a bird collector. And specifically, he only collects the birds after he's killed the birds. And that's what Sylvia cannot understand. Number three, Sylvia planned to climb the tree in order to do what? A, find the heron's nest so that she could tell the guest. B, enjoy the sunrise and the beauty of nature. C, make her day more exciting. Or D, find better grazing land for the cow. And it's A. She, she risks an awful lot going up high in this tall pine tree, uh, but she finds the heron's nest. And then she discovers that it's already paired up with another heron. And ultimately she makes the decision not to reveal the nest. How about this? The guest thought that, what did the guest think? The grandmother had seen the heron, that Sylvia had seen the heron and that she would uh, tell him where she saw it or that his search for the heron was hopeless or that he would have to hunt the heron for months. And of course, he thought that Sylvia had seen it and that she could tell him where she saw it. And she won't do that. Sylvia does not tell the guest where to find the heron because. So ultimately she resolves this internal conflict. And why does she not tell him?
Well, she doesn't tell him because she's felt this connection to nature. She's felt a connection to the heron, especially when she saw it from high up above and she saw that it had paired up with another heron. And so she protects nature and she refuses to tell the man what she knows. Some quick sentence completions here. Uh, these are the literary terms. See if you can fit these in there. An element that occurs or recurs in one or more works of literature is called, yes, a motif. And that could be a phrase, it could be a word, it could be an image, uh, even a pattern of actions that happen again and again and again uh, becomes a motif. A blank is a struggle between two forces in a literary work. This one you should have been able to answer in fifth grade. That's conflict. And number three, Sylvia's conflict between telling the man where the heron's nest is and preserving the heron uh, is an example of internal conflict. Sylvia against Sylvia. The references to Sylvia's relationship with nature, these are examples of, and that's a bad question, internal conflict. Uh, the references isn't the conflict. You see the conflict as you constantly see these references. I would reword that question if I were putting it on a test. <coughs> uh, the basis of Sylvia's internal conflict lies in, it lies in her desire to please her grandmother and the man maybe even make the money, but at the same time save the heron. And she cannot have both. And ultimately she decides on the heron. All right, and that is our introduction and check for understanding uh, to the white heron. And at this point, you probably wanna check Schoology, make sure you don't have any other assignments that go with this. Perhaps there's, perhaps there's a check for understanding quiz. Perhaps there are some levels of thinking questions. Check the due dates, make sure you get those in by the, uh, by the deadline. If you stayed with me all, through, all the way through the end of this, I thank you and I'll see you in class. Mm -hmm.